Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Mipple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Golem. Coming up. Let's learn to play Golem. Game designed by Flaminia Brasini, Virginio Gigli, and Simone Luciani, and published by Cranio Creations. And if you find value from this video later, please hit that like button. Subscribe to us and hit the bell. Leave your feedback in the comments for others to find. For now, let's get to the table. Golem is a 1 to 4 player game based around the Jewish legend of the Golem clay creatures crafted to help the people. Over four rounds of play, players will draft marbles and send their rabbis out in search of points by building golems, studying, crafting artifacts, upgrading, and scoring objectives. The player who scores the most points after four rounds of play will win the game. I won't step you through the full setup for the game. There is an advanced setup which involves some randomization of components and drafting, as well as a recommended basic setup which chooses those components for you. What I will now do is show you some of the main components in the game. At the top of the main board you'll find the four characters, and there's one of these for each of the rounds in the game. Next to them is the library, which is a market of book cards you'll be able to purchase through the game, as well as a shuffled deck. At the bottom of the board is the cemetery, where any golems killed during the game will end up. But the main part of this board is the three districts, red, yellow, and blue. These districts represent a sort of two-level track advancement mechanic in the game. Along the top, each player will have one student, and that student will be advancing towards these income icons. Down the bottom is the blocks, and this is where the player's golems will move. Players will not necessarily have the same number of golems in each district. In between are a series of actions which golems may be able to take, and do note that golems can either be standing up or lying down. These have different meanings in the game. Each player has a player board which includes a separable artifact tile. The board is split into three areas with roughly the same colour coding as the main board. Your red section which represents your golems, your blue section representing study, and your yellow section representing artifacts. This includes two tracks that you'll advance on during the game. The study track represented by the open book, and the golem track represented by the fist. On each section you will find six overlay tiles for a total of 18. These are your development tiles and represent upgrades that you can make through the game. You'll also have four golems that you can build, three end game objective cards which you hold secretly in hand, and some of the game's four resources, clay, knowledge, coins, and gold. These resources too are approximately color coded by the area that needs them the most. Finally, you have the action board, which is split into two areas by the turn order track. On the left is the marble or synagogue actions, including a synagogue marble tower, which will distribute marbles among the five different synagogue actions. And on the right, a column of tiles, which represent the rabbi actions, which will change from round to round. All of the game's action selection takes place on this board. So, now that we've seen all the main components, let's learn how to play. Golem is played in four rounds, and each round is played in seven phases. First, Refresh, in which you'll set up the board for the round. Second, Golem Movement, where all players will advance their golems through the districts. Thirdly, Actions, which is the longest phase of a round. Here, players will go back and forth, taking a total of three actions each. 2 by drafting marbles from the synagogue, and 1 by placing a rabbi on an action tile. Fourthly, turn order will be adjusted. Fifth, the bonus action on this round's character is resolved. Sixth, players receive any income they've unlocked, and may optionally pay for one development. 
And finally, controlling golems, in which players must pay some knowledge for each golem that is further advanced in its district than that player's student. Across the four rounds of play, players will be attempting to score victory points, represented by the star, and menorahs in the three colours, red, yellow and blue, and these serve as a multiplier for some endgame points. The player with the most points after four rounds and endgame scoring will win the game. So now let's look at the different phases of each round in detail. Since the refresh phase is skipped in round one, we'll start with the golem movement phase. In the current round's turn order, each player determines their total number of golem movement points, which is based on this number on the golem track, plus this number on the current round's character. So in this case, six. The player must now spend all of these golem movement points moving golems from left to right on their districts, but may distribute the points however they wish among all of their golems. The chosen golems may be standing, or they may be lying down, and if a lying golem is moved, it stands up. An unmoved golem remains lying down. If a golem steps across into one of the last three blocks of a district, then you must pay either the knowledge or victory point cost shown on the step. And if you're ever unable to use all of your golem steps, because all of your golems are at the end of their district, then you lose five points per unused step, up to a maximum of five points per golem. Once all players have moved their golems, it's time for the actions phase. The actions phase is played in turns, beginning in turn order. On your turn, you have three options. You can draft a marble and take the corresponding marble action. You may place your rabbi and take the corresponding rabbi action. Or you may pass. In each round, you must take exactly two marble actions exactly one rabbi action, and you may pass up to twice. When you take a marble action, choose any one marble from the synagogue tray, noting its color, its row, and how many marbles were in that row before you took it. You'll store the marble on your player board till the end of the round. Next, advance students on their tracks based on the color of marble that you drew. For a coloured marble, advance your student on that coloured track. For the black marble, advance one student on each of two different tracks. And for a white marble, do nothing. As your students advance, you'll earn more and better incomes for the income phase, and the first student to cross this step of each track gains the corresponding menorah. Although the white marbles may seem weak, they count as a wild colour later on in step 5 when you're trying to match the colours on these character cards, but more on that later. Next, resolve the action from the row from which you took the marble. Each action has multiple parts, which you may do once each in any order. Each of the actions has one number replaced by the variable x, and x is equal to the number of marbles that was in that row before you took your marble. So in this instance, two. To take your one rabbi action, take your rabbi meeple and place it onto an unoccupied rabbi action tile, or onto the permanently printed action at the bottom, which may hold any number of rabbis. Rabbis sharing the bottom action are placed left to right as this influences turn order. Then resolve the action. Other than the printed action, all of these will change out from round to round in the refresh phase. The final option on your turn is to pass, and when you pass, you take the lowest numbered remaining pass tile from those available. Passing does not mean that you lose any of your actions. It means that you defer your remaining actions to the end of the round, and may get a better choice of marbles to choose from. How this works is as follows. After all players have either taken three actions or passed, then whoever has the number one pass tile chooses any one marble from the synagogue and places it on that tile. Another player then gathers all remaining marbles and dumps them back into the synagogue, giving a new distribution. Players who have pass tiles will now take actions in pass tile number order from those same three choices, doing a marble action, doing a rabbi action, 
or passing again. If anyone passes again, then you'll repeat the process for a second passing round, but this is the last opportunity to pass. After the second passing round is complete, all players must have taken exactly two marble actions and one rabbi action. In this way, passing lets you hunt for exactly the marble action combination that you need, but it reduces the odds of getting it with each subsequent pass. So, now that we understand how the actions round takes place, let's take a look at the actions themselves. The first action is work, and this is how you make your golems take actions. At a cost of 1, 3, 5, or 8 knowledge, less a discount equal to X, you can make 1, 2, 3, or 4 of your golems work in their current blocks. Only standing golems, who were already on the board before you started your action, may work. When a golem works, resolve the action in its current block, and then lie it down. When you take the golem action, you may gain X clay, upgrade one red golem development, and build one golem. To upgrade golem development, pay the clay showing on the tile, and then flip the tile over to the upgraded side. This will give you a combination of special abilities related to your golems and red menorahs. To build a new golem, take one of your golem pieces and place it standing in the first block of a district of your choice. Take note of any golems that you already have in that district, and then pay three clay plus three additional clay for each golem that was already in the district. Finally, move up two steps on the golem track. This increases both your golem movement and your victory point income. When you take the artifacts action, you may gain X coins, make one artifacts upgrade, and pay three coins to gain one gold. This section of your board represents your artifacts, and artifacts are good for gaining both income and endgame points. The artifact itself is represented by this column of light grey icons. These columns here represent slots into which you can upgrade the associated artifact. These melting pots represent places where you would need to place gold to activate the corresponding artifact. And this column of tile represents the potential development upgrades which you haven't yet built. Any time you gain or purchase a gold bar during the game, you place it onto any empty slot in these melting pots. When you completely fill a pot, then the associated artifact is considered active and you immediately gain the income showing on it. So here, one knowledge. You'll gain this income again in each subsequent income phase. To upgrade a grey development, choose any one of these three tiles and flip it over to either of its sides, and then place it into any one of these four slots, paying the cost in coins that you cover. You can upgrade an active or inactive artifact. Each subsequent time you activate this artifact, including when you first build the artifact, but not when you first build the upgrade onto an already built artifact, you'll gain both the base income and the additional income. To upgrade a gold development tile, choose either of these two tiles, again flipping it to either side, and place it onto one of these spaces, paying the cost that you cover. These provide new triggers to activate the artifact, so here every time you drew a blue marble, you would again activate this artifact. This top one activates each time you start a new column of books, which we'll talk about next, or each time you build a golem. Each development also reveals a yellow menorah when you build it. For the bottom development tile, should you purchase it, you simply flip it over in place, and it will give you three menorahs. With the study action, you may gain X knowledge, upgrade one study development, and gain one book. When you upgrade a study development, pay the amount of knowledge showing on the tile, and then flip it over to its other side. These four reveal a bonus which you can trigger later. This one simply reveals menorahs, and this one increases the value of your study track. As with the other areas, all of them reveal at least one menorah. To purchase a book, 
look at the face-up cards in the library section of the main board and pay the total cost printed on the card and board. For the four types of coloured books, this will be a knowledge cost. And for the black book, in addition to the library knowledge, you'll have to move one student of your choice backwards one step. For whichever one you choose, pay its cost, slide the remaining cards to the left, replacing from the right from the top of the deck, and then work out which of the four columns the book is going to go into. If you already have a book of that colour, then it must go in the same column. If you don't have a book of that colour, it can go into any empty column, while black is a wild colour and may go into a column with any other colour. You're also not allowed to exceed the book limit based on your current position on the study track in any given column. So right now, this player would not be allowed to buy another red book because it would have to go in this column, but the study track is not high enough for three books in a column. Having established all of this, you'll now gain the bonuses. Firstly, you'll gain the immediate effect, which is printed on the bottom half of your new book tile and then you'll slot that card underneath those already present. Then from bottom to top, starting with the development tile, if you've upgraded it, gain each of the bonuses in that column. So here, two points, then one point for each level on the golem track, and then two points. In this way, you'll see that if you focus on making a really tall stack in one column, then you'll have a very strong engine going within that column. But, as we'll see later, there's also good endgame points in diversifying and having at least one book in each column. Also be aware that there's nothing in this action which automatically increases your position on the study track. You need to find these book icons to work your study track up in different ways. The last marble action is the mirror, and here you can spend one coin to do any one of the other four marble actions, and spend three coins to move up one step on the study track. When you mirror another action, the value of X is based on the number of marbles in the mirror row, not in the other row. Much like passing, the mirror action gives you a way of taking the actions you want with maybe a different colour of marble than what's available, or with a higher value. There are 12 different rabbi action tiles which are going to come out through the game, and I'm not going to go through what all of these are. They are mostly variations on the actions we've already seen, and you can read the full details in the rulebook. However, one important action is this one here on the permanent tile, which is killing a golem. To do this, choose any one of your golems anywhere on the board, standing or lying, and then move it down to an unoccupied cemetery space excluding any which are locked out for your player count. Immediately get the benefit that you cover, and go down one step on your golem track. Once all valid reward cemetery spaces are full, you'll start filling to the right of the cemetery, which may hold any number of golems. After actions are done, you will rearrange turn order, and the new turn order will be from top to bottom, left to right, based on the placement of your rabbis this round. Then you'll resolve this round's character. In the new turn order, any player who took marble actions matching this character's requirements, remembering that white marbles count as wild for these purposes, can now resolve this bottom effect. This will either be to spend some amount of money in order to gain a bonus effect, which towards the end of the game will be victory points, or instead to gain three coins. Then flip the round's character face down. Next is income and development. All players will first gain their incomes, which can come from four different places. From the icons under any students who have reached at least the third step of their districts, for your position on the study track, for your position on the golem track, and for any artifacts which are fully activated. Each player may now develop one upgrade from any one of the three regions on the player board. The final phase is to control your golems, and you will evaluate each golem and compare its position with the student in the same district. If the golem is ahead, then you must pay knowledge equal to the difference. So this golem would cost one, two, three, four. 
this golem would be free, this golem would be free, and this one would cost two, for a total of six knowledge. If you don't have enough, then pay all of your knowledge and lose five points for each golem that was not fully paid for. Golem control is one of the major things that you need to balance in this game, in particular because all of the good actions that the golems can take are towards the right hand side of the board, but your students are inherently a lot slower moving than your golems. You have to work out the strategy which suits your game the best. You could generate a strong knowledge engine to make sure that you can keep pushing your golems to the valuable side and paying for them. Or you could maximise the number of golems that you build in order to spread your golem movement points more evenly across the golems and keep them towards the left. You could race your golems ahead to take the good actions and then kill them down to the cemetery, both to get rid of the control cost and to get these extra bonuses. Or you can look for upgrades or actions which mitigate either the control cost or keep your golems from moving too far. All provide possible ways of mitigating the control cost. Unless it's the final round, you'll now go to the refresh phase of the next round. Take all players' marbles, and all of those remaining in the trays and dump them back in the synagogue. You should always drop them all at once rather than one at a time, as this will give a better distribution. Discard last round's rabbi tiles and place new ones out according to your player count. When the stack runs empty, shuffle the discards into a new draw pile. And discard the leftmost book, refilling it from the stack. You'll now go on to golem movement for the new round. After four rounds, the game is over and you'll proceed to final scoring. First, you'll score your artifacts, constructed golems and book columns based on the matching colour of menorah. For the artifacts, each completed artifact, that is a filled melting pot, scores a number of points equal to revealed yellow menorahs. So here are three artifacts times three menorahs for nine points. In the study area, each column of books scores one point per blue menorah that you have, irrespective of the height of the column. So here, two columns times seven menorahs for 14 points. In the golem area, for each golem that you've built, that is each empty space here, you'll score one point for each red menorah. So here, four golems times six menorahs is 24. It does not matter if you've killed these golems since constructing them, and your starting golems don't count. Next, score 2, 4 or 7 points if you've reached one of the top 3 steps of the study track. Now evaluate your objective cards. These will each be worth 2, 4 or 6 points, depending on whether it's the easy, medium or hard version of that objective. Here for example, you've reached step 8 on the study track, so this will score 6 points. You've done at least seven development upgrades, and therefore both the seven upgrades and the five upgrades objectives are completed, for four and two points respectively. This objective, four golems in the cemetery, let's suppose this wasn't completed. After gaining objective points, you'll also gain objective variety points for the number of different types of objectives you've completed. These three objectives are of two types, and so for two types you would gain two points. Three types grants five points, and four or more grants nine. Finally, gain one point for each five total leftover resources. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, final turn order, based on final round rabbi position, breaks the tie. And that's how to play Golem. We hope that you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new and exciting videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comment section below. See you next time.